Welcome everyone to uh, the People's Earth Week art training this evening. We're really excited to have you all here with us tonight. Um, thanks for hanging out with us while we listen to a little bit of music and get grounded in the space. Um, while folks were joining, it's good to see everyone. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Amy, she, her. I'm the senior climate finance finance strategist at Stand.Earth, but I'm not here in that capacity this evening. Um, I'm here in my artist capacity and supporting all of our amazing artists um, in this training this evening. So we wanted to bring everybody together tonight to you know, support partnerships between community-oriented community artists and grassroots climate justice campaigns taking on the fossil fuel industry. We believe these partnerships can help win campaigns, share skills and build experience that help groups and movements use arts to become more effective and win positive change. And I just wanted to share one of my favorite art quotes. Um, it's the labor and social movement artist Ricardo Levens Morales wrote that humans are story driven. We make choices according to how we understand the world to be. Art speaks directly to those deep inner spaces where the stories are stored. There is no place that that is more true um, that the, than the climate change struggle, from big oil telling a story of doubt and denial to grassroots movements telling the stories of protecting our water, communities, and climate. We're really excited to have y'all with us tonight. So I just wanted to ground us in that, ground us in a little bit of logistics. This training will be recorded um, and shared with all the resources afterwards. Um, and then the, you can use the chat and the Q&A function um, for questions. There is transcri transcription available, so please use that function um, in the toolbar to access. Um, and we're going to get started tonight. I am really excited to introduce our artists. Um, and we're going to pop our slides on do a little bit of intro, and then we're gonna ask some cool questions um, and have our artists talk about their inspiration and their art. Um, so our first artist tonight is on the next slide. Um, I am very excited to once again be introducing um, the amazing Jackie Fawn to all of you. Um, I'm not gonna read bios tonight. We're just putting these on the screen so folks can read them. I really, I don't want you to listen to me talk tonight. I want you to meet the artists and I want you to listen to them talk. Um, on the next slide, we also have with us this evening, the amazing art of Dio Kramer. Um, we are so pleased to have them with us tonight. Um, I am always completely inspired <laughs> by the art that is, is created by Dio. So we're very excited to have them with us tonight. And then on the next slide, we also have with us this evening, Moselle Singh. Uh, Moselle's art is also featured in the newspaper that y'all have been receiving. Um, and don't worry if you aren't reading these bios very quickly, we'll send this out to you afterwards, um, especially so you can click on the links um, and go to the artist's websites. Next with us tonight, we have Jan Berger with us once again. Thank you for being with us again. Um, I am a big fan <laughs> of all the puppets. Um, and have been inspired over the years to make my own puppets uh, because of Jan's work. On the next slide, we have Emily Thiessen with us tonight. Beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous art that you will be receiving um, from their studio. And then on the next slide, 
We have Josie Igno Tewitz uh, with us this evening. I knew I was going to mess that up. I gave it a good shot. Um, so now we're going to take it off screen share, and I want you to see <laughs> all the artists in our gallery. Um, and I'm going to ask some prompt questions of our artists, and they are going to talk to you about their designs. Um, so first, our prompt questions this evening for our artists are, tell us about your design um, for this art week of action, um, and tell us anything that you want to say about yourself as an artist protecting communities and the planet. Um, and if Jackie doesn't mind, I will put her on the spot first <laughs> and turn the floor over to her um, to talk about her art. Jackie. Oh man, this illustration. When I was asked to create an illustration around this, I was so excited. And I'm a really big nerd. Everyone's like, who's your favorite superhero? I was like, none of them. If you're talking about Marvel or DC, none of them. And I spent a lot of time of crafting my own heroes, which is really amazing. Water protectors, land defenders, those are my heroes. Those are the ones I want to see on the cover of comic books and taking over Batman's spot because Batman's a capitalist and loves to work with cops. He's a snitch. So I'm not a Batman fan. I'm sorry, everyone out there. He never once wanted to protect the earth. He just wants self-interest. So I want to spend all my time creating amazing warriors and heroes and uplifting our community stories because I think they're way cooler than watching Batman put people in jail. It's like, I don't want to see that because it's probably my friends. So that's where this inspiration came up. I was like, who's my hero? I think my heroes are the young people, the, the young folk that are begging us to make change, to fight for change for the people that have that capacity. And I want to show up for them. I was like, those are the people that inspire me and I want to draw that all day. That's who I want to see on the cover of these comic books. Cause in my mind, I'm like, how are there so many incredible artists in these comic industries that are spending their entire craft, creating stories that aren't supporting our communities that aren't supporting um, the earth. So that's where the inspiration of this illustration came up from was a young black indigenous girl beating up smokestacks and protecting the earth. Because those are the things I want to see in mainstream media. So that's that's what I got to say. Amazing. Yes. And 100 snaps for Jackie and that because this art is amazing. And that is that those are our heroes. Our heroes are on the front lines. Um, next, I'm going to pass it over to Dio to talk about the inspiration for their art. Hi. Um, Inspiration for this art, I met a lot of this crew doing art through the Line 3 movement, which was how I got involved in um, like using my art for uh, activism. And when David reached out to me about to do his design for this collection, I think it was right around the time that they finished construction on the pipeline after like my personal involvement for I think like three four years at that point and you know on the backs of people who've been doing this work for decades um, and so I was thinking a lot about uh, resilience and like things that will continue to like grow and break through and 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 heal um, in, in a period of time where I like definitely needed that energy myself um, so that was where this design came from and it's really cool to um, yeah like there's a few artists who are in this room whose like artwork I started recognizing from afar for years, um, years prior. And then now to be able to like co-work with everybody and, you know, spread out across the country is a really cool thing. So, um, but yeah, I think that was mostly my inspiration for this design. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next, I will pass it over to Moselle. Hi, yeah, so my name is Moselle and um, that means drawn from water. So that's why that's in parentheses by my name. Um, so this piece, I actually started this as a design that came from um, making artwork to protest the CO2 pipelines that are being pr proposed for across Iowa, which is where I, I grew up. Um, I always say that's the land that raised me. Um, so I collaborate with Great Plains Action Society, which is an amazing organization. Um, they're the only indigenous led organization in Iowa. Um, 
So I was collaborating with Sakawas, who's the founder, to create some artwork to amplify the protest. And um, one of the phrases we came up with was, these roots run deep, um, no CO2 pipelines. So basically saying like the roots of the prairie, the roots of the animals, the roots of uh, all the people who are, who are raised by the land run deeper than the CO2 pipelines. So the piece kind of was coming from all of that and honoring um, the more than human relatives that are of this land. So that's where that was coming from. And then I was weaving in different elements of my own identity because that's something that I think is really important for myself to start bringing to the surface. I'm actually newer to this whole world of making art like publicly. Um, it's something that I intimately have done for myself forever, but most of my life I've worked in biodiversity, conservation, agroecology. Um, so a lot of my experience is actually hands-on um, on the ground with plants. I'm used to being like not in front of people, uh, not in this capacity at all. And so I quit all of my work though in nonprofits in 2020, turned to artwork and was no longer affiliated with any organization because I really wanted that freedom, mm -hmm. that liberation to, to um, be involved as an individual and carry all of my complexity forward, which uh, artwork is such an amazing vehicle for being honest about all aspects of ourselves, no matter our backgrounds. Um, so I was able to be my diasporic identity of a Punjabi American. My mom is white. My dad is from Punjab, which a lot of people don't know anything about Punjab. So I also feel this really strong desire for people to know what it means to be of Punjab, the land of five rivers. Um, it's a region that was split in half by the British partition of um, Pakistan and India, well, the creation of Pakistan, and it was done quite purposefully. There's a reason why they, they split that region in half. Uh, so the identity I carry is one that is very, very deep, very, very important to me. Um, anyways, my point is there's the Harappan style that's infused in there. So if you don't know the ancient Indus Valley civilizations, Harappa is one site and the artwork has a very distinct style to it. Um, so I was weaving in kind of an inspiration from that to bring that forward and uh, communicate that I am of both the Great Plains and of Punjab. And that goes very, very deep for me. So I just, am, I guess my artwork is a mechanism for encouraging people of different identities to bring forward all of their complexity. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, next, I'm going to pass it over to Jan. I think Jan is on mute. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry about that. I, I love making art that, that helps activist causes and have been doing that kind of stuff for years. I have a puppet theater that I started years ago called Paper Hand. And we do giant puppet shows kind of in the tradition of bread and puppet theater down in North Carolina. And um, we create stories that um, are helping move forward social causes. And we love taking those puppets out into the street and helping activist groups uh, realize what they're um, their stories are and make them visual and beautiful and kind of highlight the actions that are happening and use art as a tool for organizing people. Um, so we make giant 3D things, but I've, you know, since I was young, been a more of a 2D artist. And so being influenced by Bread and Puppet, I, you know, I've done like a lot of block printing kind of things. And working in reverse where you're carving away. And a lot of my art is paper cut art. So actually trimmed from a piece of paper and then, you know, taking a photo of it and making it um, colored somehow if you're going to reproduce it as a poster. Um, so I do, again, this is like you're removing <laughs> and what you have left is the black. And that's a very fun way. Uh, for me to work. I like thinking about things in big chunks uh, like that. 
And I love how, whether you're making a poster or whether you're making 3D art, how you can take it outside of the theater into a street format and use that art as a way of transforming people's bodies, transforming a situation, de-escalating if it's necessary or elevating or bringing more power um, to your message when you're out and uh, protesting actively um, or, or doing a direct action. Um, and with that piece that I've made, I, I really like hands a lot. My puppet theater is called Paper Hand because we all, or most all of us have hands and it's sort of like a universal um, symbol of humanness or five fingers. And I liked including the land and the water together. That was a fun challenge of that, all these things that are important to us. So the hands, kind of like a child's hand. So we push on the sand and build up like a, an imaginary wall of protection. That's about it. Thank you so much. Um, and I will pass it to Emily. It's really neat to be on this call uh, with all of you. I think I've also seen a lot of your art from afar on like Instagram. Now here you are. Um, so this poster was originally a design to support the movement to stop old growth logging uh, where I live, which is now what's known as British Columbia. Um, and there were organizers that were planning this like massive march and rally that happened this past February. And they asked me to make a poster that would represent like a new um, large scale kind of like turning of the tide in the movement. So there have been, there were these massive blockades at Ferry Creek that maybe some of you heard about. Um, and those went on for um, about two years and there's still people there, but they've slowed down because the weight of like fighting back against the RCMP's injunction was just getting too heavy. Um, and so I think people in the movement wanted to sort of break open like a new phase of resistance for what's next. Um, so there's this rally. I heard there's going to be maybe some new direct action happening in this movement starting really soon, which is exciting. It's kind of, I think, what people were hoping would happen after the rally. Um, so basically, I was asked, yeah, to come up with a design that represented like new energy and also a diversity of people, maybe new people coming together. Um, and so, yeah, I was trying to come up with a design that was welcoming and had kind of a diversity of like plant and animal species. Something that I do I, a lot of my work is I, I think I try to use animals um, as symbols for people. So I have a lot of like animals mobilizing. So like they kind of do represent animals, but they also represent people mobilizing too, as if we were um, flocks of birds or schools of fish. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, animals in this poster that are at risk because of old growth logging. And so there are marbled murrelets, for example, spotted owl, mountain caribou, um, different guys like that. Um, yeah, I kind of, I think I came to know David and some of all of your work more through climate justice, um, but the movement to stop old growth logging and climate justice where I live are like very much connected um, and very, yeah, we're very, I don't know, grounded in like local resource extraction struggles over here. It's kind of like a frontier where there's a lot of, um, a lot of like maybe forests and things like that that haven't been extracted yet that are gone in a lot of other places. And we're kind of, I don't know, maybe see ourselves as fighting for like the last pieces. Um, yeah, I think I can leave it there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Josie. You're still muted. There you go. There you go. Hi, I'm Josie. Um, she, they pronouns, uh, comfortable with both. I am based in Bobancha, um, aka New Orleans, uh, adjacent to Louisiana for a Green New Deal. Um, yeah, so Louisiana, really the whole Gulf South, is truly being sacrificed to fossil fuels. Um, we have over 34 new projects uh, planned for Louisiana alone. That includes 12 liquefied natural gas terminals and extremely dirty methane intense fuel. Um, they're trying to build in vulnerable flood zones and our, our um, beloved wetlands. 
and we have petrochemical plants that are trying to build, even though we have over 150 of them already in Cancer Alley. And now we have this new threat of carbon capture and storage facilities and pipelines um, in our bayous. So we're just up against a lot and it's time to get activated and really focus on stopping the funding for these, these mega polluting projects. Um, and what I so admire about the environmental justice movement in the Gulf South is that these frontline communities or what we call fence line communities because they're literally up against the fences of these petrochemical facilities and um, mega polluting facilities, they've been working for decades. They're up against corporations and billionaires. However, they keep fighting and they're winning. You know, we've been able to stop Formosa, or like majorly delay Formosa petrochemical facility. And uh, the EPA is now su suing Denka for toxic emissions. So surely, slowly but surely we're winning. And um, I think this poster just kind of, I wanted to highlight that joyful resistance that we have here in the Gulf um, and how our ecology and our ecosystems are fighting back, standing up and winning and not losing that sense of hope. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Oh, thank you so much. It is, this is so amazing to hear how everyone was inspired to create this beautiful art. I find myself like, just like, oh my gosh, I get to like introduce these people and I get to like to ask them about their art. That's my favorite, favorite part of, the, of this job, hands down. Um, and so now um, I put it in the chat, but I will verbalize it to everyone on the call tonight. Um, if you have any questions or something you want to ask one of the artists, please feel free to either put it in the chat, which I'm not sure we have the chat enabled, um, but definitely in the Q&A function. So if you go down to your toolbar on the bottom right smack in the middle is the Q&A. Um, and you can definitely ask the artist some questions. Um, so if you have one, I will ask for you. Okay, the chat is disabled. Um, so yeah, definitely in the Q&A then. Um, okay, and I have someone um, asking, I work in South Louisiana. I'd like to get connected with Josie if that's possible. Um, <laughs> so I will put my email um, in the chat and you can email me and um, I will hook you up with Josie. Um, I don't know if, how Josie feels about putting um, their personal email in, <laughs> in the chat. Like if you're okay with that or answering that in the Q&A, definitely get connected. All right, our next one is, oh, this is so good. I love this one so much. Um, do you have any advice for a young artist slash activist? I'm 12. Um, we have so much in this room, <laughs> so much advice, um, but I'll leave it to the artist to give some loving advice to our young artist. Does anyone want to jump in? I say trust the process. It's really hard in this day and age because of the internet just is so overwhelming. I just say take it day by day. And definitely trust your process and follow your inspirations and just let the land call you and inspire you. And the process is a beautiful journey. It's hard. It's consuming, but it is worth it because it's your voice in the end that comes out of it. And that's the most beautiful part about it. Yes, so much that. Does anyone else want to share some advice? Jan? I mean, I would say find um an action or a group that you can take part in that where your artwork can be used and instrumental and important um and and trust that it will like um be be helpful for the movement i think um something that inspires you work that inspires you uh a movement that inspires you and um that that you feel like um, you can keep on working with and people that you're working with too that um, that feed you because um, it's it's a lot of work and can be very stressful so yep yes yes 
all of that. And um, I will also um, shoot you over my email, um, Adam, if you ever want to chat or you need an adult mentor, um, someone in the movement who can help you out. Um, I would be happy to be that person for you. So I'll shoot you over my email. Um, I also, there's a, there's a, oh, there's a spicy question in the Q and A. <laughs> um, so the question is, I would love to hear from artists about their experience collaborating with climate movement orgs and experiences like, you know, what's been good and what can be improved so mo more artists can get engaged. I like that. Anyone even want feel called to answer that one? I actually do feel called to answer that um, because my collaboration with Great Plains Action Society has completely changed my life. Um, so my experience has been so phenomenal because the it's it's really important for people to shift the way they engage with um, artists rather than it being a transactional relationship, which is such a capitalist tendency to really approach it as a collaboration. That's why I actually use the word collaborator rather than anything else, because you're engaging in a relationship. So it's like, it's meant to be ongoing. It's meant to be creative. It's meant to be one that inspires both sides. Um, so I, I am just so grateful for that connection. And I would say that that's not always the case. Um, a lot of people have approached me again, like I said, as a transaction, and there's not much of an understanding of the creative process itself, um, because the creative process is something that's very dynamic and changes. And it's, um, you have, as a human being, you have to be in touch with your own needs, emotional, mental health needs, and having really strict deadlines sometimes can be challenging. So having support throughout and knowing that you're working with someone who genuinely cares about you as a human being and as a creative person and a collaborator makes a huge difference. So I've never felt more valued in a relationship before and a collaboration before. Um, so I'm just super grateful. Yes, so much. Anyone else feel called to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dio and Josie or Josie and then Dio. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, shortly, I am actually not necessarily involved with any specific organization or like on anyone's payroll. And I think um, me in my position of being adjacent to organizations and showing up when I can, it means that I, um, you know, opportunities come to me because I'm showing up in a way that I can show up and not like I don't get burnt out. Um, and so those, yeah, just putting that in there. Opportunities will come if you just kind of show up, do your passion um, and not necessarily feel like you have to work under a specific organization's banner. Um, I've, I've had a number of similar experiences of like feeling a lot of the power of being able to like move between and collaborate amongst different groups as like being able to speak as an individual. So I totally agree with that. I think that's been really cool. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to say is I've had experiences on both ends of the spectrum in terms of like the timeline of when artists get involved. And there are some times where like people plan a whole action and it's happening in three days and then they call you and they're like, and we need a poster for it and a bunch of art. And you're like, sorry, in 72 hours, like we'll see what we can do. Um, and then sometimes people bring you on at the very beginning of the planning for something. And um, that gives you a lot of opportunity to like use art in a different capacity like as the action sometimes or like just be able to hold like a more authentic role in that um you know and I think there's a time and a place for everything across the spectrum and you know not all of the like not everyone has enough time to plan as much as we would want um but definitely like getting to be involved in things as an organizer as well as an artist has been a really cool way to like make sure that like uh, the art that's being used for movements is like getting to be, um, yeah, used in a more full capacity. So I, those have been my favorite experiences. Mm, excellent. Um, and yes, like I, just and more advice for folks just who are on this call. And if you're 
um, you're looking for art and you want an artist to support your actions or your local group, um, pay them financial reciprocity, fam. That's how we take care of our artists. Um, and David and I have this grand plan of like, someday we're going to have all the funders throwing money at us and we're going to fund all the artists in the movement and we're going to do all these amazing things. That's the way it should be. That's what we see for this movement is that, you know, our artists and our musicians, like they're the heart and soul of everything that we do. I mean, think about when we were during the pandemic where we were, you know, dark and despair and you know, fear and that sort of thing. What what did we turn to in those times? We turned to our artists. We turned to art and to music and to visual and to beautiful things that inspired us. Um, so I just, I, you know, I just want to show so much appreciation um, for our artists because it, it is everything to this movement. And I, you know, <laughs> I want to give you guys a million dollars for every piece of art you make because it is so so needed and so amazing and we all value you uh, so much um so just from us to you uh, the artists like we really do value you uh, we have time i think for a couple more questions for the artists um and then we got to get on to some training so i think i could do one more question and then i will answer the rest of them um by replying to you and everybody wants to see your art again so once we wrap up the q a um, i'm gonna have alec run through your bios one more time because people wanted to see your art again um let's see oh man some of these are so good we're gonna have to i'm gonna have to email some of these but um let's see Ooh, somebody wants to know if you know of any artists out there that do work around nuclear uh, bombs. Um, they are in Kansas City, um, and they're dealing with a huge factory that makes 85% of the parts um, for nukes. So I think that is a good question for this group of folks, if you know anyone in that neck of the woods or who does that kind of art. So I feel like that question and a few several other questions were overlapping with creative asks and honestly you need to start local like you'll be surprised and shocked how many artists are in your circles that have roots to these issues and I've seen people like oh do you know do you know artists in New Mexico lo and behold you have probably family in your air in your networks and that do art and are just want waiting don't even know that these opportunities are out there like for me I grew up always knowing how to draw but it was frontline my, my land defender and water protector family that taught me what to draw and like how to use my art for creative resistance and these kind of tact, like creative tactics. And that's where it really starts. Like, you know, support your local artists. Like they're out there and they want to do this stuff too. And a lot of times they don't know that they can use art for change and just support your local artists and your, your friends, your family, because they're artists and in there, there too, that know these issues just as much as you do and are passionate about it. Because as much as you want to contract artists out that are within that do movement art, like I'm not from that area and I don't know these issues as much as like your cousin who's an incredible artist. So that's what I like for a lot of those issues, like questions that are overlapping, support your local artists, get them involved. And, you know, they're, they're there. They're just, you just got to give them that platform because they're ready. Yep, hundred percent. I couldn't. Nobody could have said it better, Jackie. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'm going to close our Q and A period. I will continue to answer the ones that are in the Q and A. I will type you answers, or I will shoot you over my email, and I will connect you with folks if you're asking. Um, and also follow Jackie's lead and find them in your local area because those artists, um, they need their creative outlet as well. Um, but we're going to go back, to, we're going to dive back into this, into this training so we can get to doing some awesome stuff in the studio with David. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that this uh, week of art action, this is for the People's Earth Week. And this, we're doing this because we have to, because the week of action during the Earth Week um, we're, we see it as like a massive reclaiming of public space um, and online space um, to lift our narratives, make our movements visible and inspire others to join. Um, during Earth Week and Earth Month, our public and online spaces are inundated with millions of dollars 
of advertising by the finance industry, fossil fuel industry, and corporations that try to greenwash and impose their narrative and manipulate us. So the People's Earth Week of Climate Justice, Art, and Action um, is a pushback. Um, it's a widespread visual and direct action intervention to disrupt the institutions that are funding and profiting from fossil fuels and climate chaos. Um, so I'm gonna share in the chat once again, the art kit link and the link to sign up for art. If you haven't gotten art yet, you can still sign up. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over and introduce um, one of my best friends in the whole world, Alec Conan, who is the co-director of Stop the Money Pipeline uh, and a longtime activist and someone um, who inspires all of us to fight every day. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alec to talk a little bit about Stop the Money Pipeline campaigns. Thanks, Amy, and uh, so good to see so many people on this call. And yeah, I'm only going to talk for for a couple of minutes, but I want to talk about. Amy said a little bit about why Earth Day, and I think Amy did a great job of um, sharing a little bit. Earth Day started off as an incredibly powerful um, people's movement. I think there were an estimated 20 million people on the street on April 20th, 1970. And there continues to be a lot of incredible work done every Earth Day, but it also is an opportunity for corporations to greenwash. And there's not an Earth Day passes without our corporations funding the climate crisis, putting out press releases about how they're reducing their trash at the same time as they're continuing to fund new oil and gas pipelines. So we are looking to, to reclaim the, the kind of radical roots of Earth Day. And... Um, yeah, I mean, it's exciting to see nearly 140 people on this call, and I think David will have the exact figures, but I think we've sent art to nearly 600 people now, and I think we're at about 50 posters a person. So I think we're, um, the artists here, we're looking at about 30,000 posters have been distributed to nearly every state in the US and, and quite a few Canadian provinces as well. So that is a lot of art that collectively we can get out and paint the walls of the the nation with um, over this week. But for Stop the Money Pipeline, um, it's not just about Earth Day. This is the most important time of the year for our campaigns. Um, this is the time of year when big banks that are financing the old growth logging and destruction, as well as the build out of new coal, oil and gas projects, have their annual shareholder meetings. And um, those uh, City Group, City Bank, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo all have their annual shareholder meetings on August and on April 25th, Tuesday, April 25th, the last day of this day of action. So the fact that we are going to be wheat pasting onto bank branches and perhaps some corporate offices, potentially in most states in the country, is this is a kind of really prime time to do that. And there's also a lot of actions happening right now too. I, I think it was just um, a couple of weeks ago we had the 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 three two one two three day of action and there was one hundred and two protests at bank branches in over thirty states, um, and that's being followed up by on April twenty fifth, um, uh, or actually on April twenty fourth, the day before the AGMs, there's going to be major actions at the headquarters of the three banks. So if you happen to be in San Francisco or New York, or Charlotte, or anywhere within a day's drive of one of those cities, um, I would encourage you that this is gonna, that's a great opportunity. Some of these actions are a little more confrontational. The folks in San Francisco are announcing their intention to entirely shut down Wells Fargo's headquarters for the day. Um, and that's, they're publicly announcing that that is, that's gonna happen, that, that Wells Fargo executives will be unable to enter the building that day. Uh, the New York action is, I think, going to be also pretty, pretty interesting, um, as as has been the case recently in New York. And uh, Green Faith is organizing a, a powerful protest in Charlotte at Bank of America, too. So this is all happening within this context. This isn't a standalone uh, moment. This is very much a part of like a multi-year multi-decade kind of struggle to get Wall Street to end financing for fossil fuels. And it's happening at the perfect time, not just because it's Earth Day, because a lot of people are paying attention, because it's literally in the days uh, and week leading up to the most important meeting of the year for our bank targets. And 
Um, that's why that's why we're asking you so much to um, send us photos of your art because we will be using those in socials throughout the week and kind of reflecting those bank to, back to the the bank targets as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah, super excited to see everyone get their art out. I'm really excited to get some art out as well. And um, that would be my one my one uh, pitch would be just don't forget to send us photos of uh, you uh, with your art pasted up um, wherever you end up uh, pasting it up. And I'll pass it back to Amy. Thank you so much. Um, and we're so excited to see all your pictures. That is honestly after the week of our action, having seen where you all put them, it's it's the best. You have to send us uh, pictures and videos. Um, next, I would love to introduce our other partner who is in on this with us. Um, I would love to introduce you to my friend Molly um, from People Versus Fossil Fuels. Um, she's just going to talk for a few minutes about People Versus Fossil Fuels stuff going on, um, and then we'll dive into the training. Thanks, Amy. It's so great to be here with you all. It's awesome to see this many people on the call and to hear from our incredible movement artists. So thank you for, for having me. Yeah, just to share a little bit, um, we're at People vs. Fossil Fuels, we're super excited about this opportunity to collaborate with Stop the Money Pipeline because as financial institutions provide the funding that, that lets fossil fuel projects move forward, the federal government holds a lot of the levers that can cut off those projects from being approved at all. And so the one-two punch of cutting off funding streams while also demanding more action from our federal leaders to use the legal powers that they already have to stop fossil fuels is really a sweet spot. And we look forward to ways our coalitions can continue to collaborate in the future. So just to give you a little info about people versus fossil fuels, we're a coalition of over 1200 organizations, including national nonprofits like my organization, Center for Biological Diversity, as well as indigenous-led, black-led, Latino-led, and social justice progressive, youth-led, faith-led groups, um, representing over millions of people across the US and we're allied with millions more around the world as we fight fossil fuels and work together towards the common goal of ending the fossil fuel system. And our focus has been since day one of Biden's presidency, asserting that Biden has the power to lead us off fossil fuels. He's just failing to use those, those powers. So from his ordinary powers, he can stop approvals for every new fossil fuel infrastructure project, including pipelines, import and export terminals, refineries and petrochem plants. Uh, he can also end the use of nationwide permits, which are used to expedite the construction of new fossil fuel infrastructure. He can direct his agencies to implement a managed decline of production of oil and gas on our public lands and waters, which makes up a quarter of our national emissions. And he can declare a national climate emergency that would unlock further powers, emergency powers, that can accelerate our transition to clean energy and further restrict fossil fuels. This could include stopping crude oil exports. It can stop the billions of private dollars that US companies invest in fossil fuel projects abroad. And it can move more federal investment into deploying renewable energy in the communities that need it most. So we've seen some action from our federal government with the Inflation Reduction Act. Unfortunately, that came with some major concessions to the fossil fuel industry. And while it's a step forward, there's so much more that needs to happen at the federal level. And Biden, as the president with these executive authorities, is the perfect decision maker to do it. So we are building on a huge moment around the Willow Project. It was absolutely devastating to see the president go back on his promise and approve that project. But the outpouring of outrage over this is nothing like we've seen before. And this is clearly a moment that People are engaged and ready to fight fossil fuels and Biden's feeling the heat. He's trying to cover up and, and trying to walk things back. And he has the power to revoke the permit, not just for Willow, but for many other fossil fuel projects that were illegally approved. So this is a key moment to, to press and we're looking ahead to September with the Climate Ambition Summit that the UN Secretary General has called that's gonna to continue to put Biden in the hot seat. 
where we can merge both domestic pressure and international pressure to really make Biden, make it clear to Biden that we expect executive action on fossil fuels before 2024. So we're excited to join this, this push and we're excited for y'all to get the art and put it out there. And there will be many more ways and many more opportunities to plug in to the work of people versus fossil fuels and South America pipeline moving, moving forward throughout the years. Excellent. Thank you so much, Molly, for being with us tonight. And thank you to People versus Fossil Fuels and Stop the Money Pipeline and everyone who contributed um, to making this week of art action happen. Um, and now for the very exciting part, um, I would love to introduce to you uh, my longtime friend and uh, fellow troublemaker, David Solnit, who is in the studio. Um, David is our longtime mass nonviolent direct action organizer. He teaches us how to use art and culture in our organizing and our direct actions. So I'm going to turn it over to David and Gemma in the studio um, so that we can learn how to we paste and we can learn how to use all this gorgeous art we're getting in the mail. Uh, David, over to you. Thank you, Amy. and. Uh... Thanks so much to uh, Amy and our two host organizations, Stop the Money Pipeline and People vs. Fossil Fuels for throwing down for art consistently over the years and putting it up front. So cool to have the artists actually talk to us about the art that we're about to wheat paste and post up all over North America. Um, so I'm gonna walk through uh, all the ways to get this stuff up in public. We printed up 10,000 copies five posters each. So that's 50,000 plus posters that we're hoping to get out everywhere. And the person who's gonna be getting them out is Gemma Searle, who's been uh, leading all the shipping. So she's going to talk to us about that. Shipping update. Your posters started going out last week. If you haven't received your order yet, don't worry. It's gonna arrive in something that looks like this or this or a larger box. It's also not too late to sign up if you want more posters after all of this exciting, inspiring conversation. It's not too late to sign up for more or if you haven't signed up yet, by all means, send us your order and we will send you art. Thank you, Gemma. And if folks have questions, uh, put them in the feed and I'm gonna uh, pray that Amy will keep track of them. And just to be super clear, uh, each of the two coalitions, each did their own newspaper. So each one has the artist statements on the back, people versus fossil fuels and stop the money pipeline. And then when you open it up, there are five full color uh, posters in each one, blank on the back so that it wouldn't bleed through. Um, so let's talk about how to put these up. I'm going to start with pasting, and I believe I have my water to a boil here. And almost everything I, everything I talk about is in the art kit. But uh, my favorite type of uh, wheat paste is cornstarch, and I use a, a cup and a half of cornstarch. In, for each gallon of water. This is a small pot and not a very hot stove. So I'm going for a half gallon of water. And so I've got about three quarters of a cup of cornstarch. I mix it in water so it's a slurry. Then, then uh, here's the key part. You wanna actually wait until the water's actually boiling. And then this is a good thing for two people, but so I'm gonna just, uh, water's boiling. If you wanna whisk, Julie, thank you. So I'm just gonna pour it in slowly. And sometimes if I don't have the water quite boiling hot, it won't quite gel, it should be slippery to your fingers, but you can kind of see it's thickening up really nicely. And I'm about to turn the heat off and actually, this is an electric, I'm gonna pull it off the burner. I think we're good. And you can sort of see it's good and slippery. And then we'll pour it into our wheat paste bucket and we're ready to go. 
So that's making it. Um, I'll just say one other thing. Uh, cornstarch is water soluble. So if it gets heavily rained on or someone wants to remove it, it can. If there's some place you don't want it to come down, sometimes what I've used is wood glue and you just thin it to about the consistency you just saw. So probably, I'm guessing now, but probably about two parts water to one part wood glue and just treat it like wheat paste. It's a little stickier and fussier and trickier, but uh, if you have some place you want to be waterproof or not to remove easily, uh, that will work as a wheat paste. I've, I've done it on places we didn't want to come off a recruiting center uh, we were doing a campaign against and uh, they had to literally scrape it off. They couldn't wash it off. So that's another option. There's also uh, using uh, wheat flour, which some people don't like because it leaves some streaks. Uh, so there's, and all that's in the art kit. So uh, talking about wheat pasting, I guess I'll, I'll talk about breakfast first. Um, can use brushes or rollers, but there's a few different types. This is a wallpaper brush from a thrift store. This is a, a deck stain brush. They're a little bit more expensive, about 15 bucks. The thing you'll find the most is a chip brush. Uh, and usually the biggest you can get is I think four inches. Sometimes just to get more glue, I just tape two together and it makes for a fatter one. I've got a nice big deck brush. You can order them. I found a place to order them pretty cheaply. That's in the art kit. So, and I've got our bucket of paste here. And then, uh, if I'm going out at night, I actually like carrying it in a bag. And then it looks more like you're shopping. And I would often put a rag in it here. And so if we're going out at night or whenever, it's it's really nice to have one person to carry the art so it doesn't get wheat paste all over it and another person to be the messy person with the wheat paste. So, uh, We'll just do a little wheat paste up here to practice. And um, you might have the person, uh, if you don't, the, it's a good spatial relationship. We'll do two of them side by side here. I sort of know what size. So I'm, I'm going to basically fill a square here, completely cover it with wheat paste. And this is a plywood, slightly porous surface. So you may want to make sure you get quite enough. I'm actually going to go both ways and then have your person, thank you, Julie, with a poster and try and put it up straight. And when they get it pretty much in position, I usually just brush it in place. So I think, I've, I think I'm good now if you want to get the next one. And so I'm trying to brush out all of the bubbles and sort of brush from the center out and just make sure that there's a solid coat. I don't want too much because I want it to dry and so it can't be peeled off. And this is Crystal Clarities who did a design so that they actually go side by side and become a blockade line. So I'm going to paste for the second one here. See if we can overlap that little white border. There we go. And a little bit my way on the bottom. Okay. And then I'm going to brush out from the center. Some people like to smooth it with their hands. I think they like the tactile thing. I like the brush, but see what works for you. And when I go out with folks, I often will bring a sheet of plywood and a brush and have everyone practice once before they go out. Um, that's, that's it on that part. Um, I'll also share uh, one thing we've been doing. We've been in the Bay Area, both we've been doing them on banks, but we've also been looking for uh, vacant, abandoned, or unmaintained buildings and we've been able to do a whole series of a whole wall of posters and uh, often those places is less risk and they stay up longer and one thing we've been adding to is uh, we've been making our own so we've taken some of the pre-printed posters but
but then also added our own messages. And so to do that, we got a, this got blank, uh, blank newsprint. You can buy it the biggest you can in pads at an art store or order it. Use a lot for packing. And that's basically the same stuff as the newspaper printed on. And Julie pre painted this for us, but we just took a newsprint, uh, laid it out in sections, and added it like this. If I was going out at, uh, to paste it, what I would typically do is fold it so it's a little bit easier. And that's often what we do with the posters too is fold them, uh, find an envelope to put them in, and then add. I, would, I might even number or write with a pencil what it says on it. We'll just do this one on the wall here. You going to uh, right here? That's about that big. that starting from the center so okay so we did this one the wrong one I'm gonna hold that and get the other one here If I find like right here, I notice I didn't get under. You can lift it up and get it underneath there. And then I'm trying to really flatten it. Make sure there's contact all the way around. A certain amount of the wrinkles, if you can kind of force the air out of them. When it dries, it will contract a little bit and flatten to some degree. I'm seeing right up here, it's not quite sticking. I'm getting a little more paste under there. But this is just words, but you can do this with, uh, you know, do your own designs to complement the artwork to, if you want something that's going to be visible to people driving down the street or down the block. Sometimes it's, we've done whole walls with the repeat posters and then one big headline up above. Um, I'll show a couple more things about pasting. You can also use a roller in a bucket. So a five gallon bucket, a paint roller. This is actually thicker of a, a roller sleeve than you want. I would usually get a three ace. You put the paste in here. This is a, a screen for uh, house painting, but I sometimes like it because you can dip your uh, in there and give it a roll off so it's more consistent. And if you're doing a huge area, a roller goes a little bit quicker. You can't flatten it as much with the brush, but you can go over it and then use your hands. And if you put a long handle on and you uh, practice a little bit, you can sometimes roller, you know, 10 feet in the air and delicately lift the poster up, but not on a windy night. It can take some, take some skill. Um, I think that's... It on pasting, and I guess the the thing folks can think about for pasting is that uh, what their safety and comfort levels are. Some people go to places where there's graffiti stuff that feels more safe, abandoned buildings, construction sites, uh, traffic stop, uh, traffic uh, control boxes, places like that. Uh, less risk, more likely to stay up longer doing it on the front of a bank, uh, having lookouts support, uh, making sure there's no one there who can't risk arrest, uh, and some way of checking if you have multiple teams. Um, so that's wheat pasting. The other option for getting the posters up is uh, posting them. And so just if, if you're not comfortable wheat pasting, you can just, uh, 
literally tape them on a wall. This model here. But, you know, you could go up to the building. This is a little bit less intense. And some communities where people didn't feel comfortable even doing this, they just, uh, they made signs out of them. Like in Paradise, California, lean the signs in front of the banks to uh, sort of have the visual and get the message out. But that's another way to get it up. Uh, we have our friend Allison likes to put them up. She does a neighborhood display on her, uh, grab me a stapler, yep. grab the neighborhood display display on her fence and she just staples them up and actually uh cuts the artist statement out on the back and staple those next to them so it's a if anyone you or someone in a public place has a fence other place to think about is like who has front uh storefront windows uh who has public community spaces walls so Maybe a few more, but if it's windy, it doesn't blow away too much. Can you show the stapler? And the, just a staple gun, a hammer tacker stapler. So posting, the next one is, uh, these make great signs for actions. And what people do the most often is find, get a, a used box, cut it out the same shape as the, the poster, and then get mat. I like to use masking tape, and I recommend not buying the super cheap kind that often doesn't have much adhesive on it, but uh, Scotch or another decent quality brand. And you sort of have it about the same size, and you can actually wrap it around the edges and that, Makes it look clean, sticks it on there really nicely. And give it a little pressure on the back. So you would go all the way down and do that. Um, you can, and this is for a lot of applications, you can lay the posters flat overnight and put books or something on them. You can also iron them. So we would go all the way around this with a Tape, and then you have a sign. Uh, you can also take that cardboard and this we put a stick on and we uh, we put some Elmer's or wood glue behind here and then staple that on just to hold it. And then we tape this onto it so that you can actually get up in the air with your signs. So those are sign applications. And uh, the last one I want to show was uh, an art show. So let's uh, come over here, Gemma. And uh, so one of the simplest ways is to just uh, either tape it to a wall some, in some public place where you can show it. And, uh, and we also have uh, in the art kit, we have downloads of all the artist statements and about this show that's on the camera now, a title sign here, and then uh, the artist statements. So you can just uh, tape it or staple it to a wall. You can hang it on a clothesline just like this. And uh, here we've actually gotten fancy. This We're going to show this off uh, this next few days. But here we actually made the cardboard bigger, painted it a color, taped the edge of the cardboard, and then got black tape and taped the poster on. But, and this is a, a nice way to hang is uh, binder clips. And these are bigger than they need to be, but uh, you know, you just, for a clothesline, you just need two points that you can tie it with. Uh, and then you can also clip the artist statements next to it, either backed on cardboard or just uh, as paper. And then I'll just show up. Uh, we're going to be displaying this in that street where there's no place, no surfaces. And we want to sort of get attention. So I got recycled plywood, painted it a pretty color, and created a little 
kiosk. And wired it on top. We'll tie a string along the bottom. And so we'll be showing this at the Bioneers in the Bay Area the next few days. And how cool for people to see an art show and be able to walk away with a newspaper with all the art in it. Uh, and one more, which is uh, this one we put on cardboard and then we screwed it onto a stick. And so this both works as a sign, but we've also used this as a display uh, for the art. You know, if you have some place you can jam it up or attach it to or screw it to a fence. It's portable and it's just, this is painted cardboard on the black, on the back uh, and screwed with uh, little flat head screws. And there are washer head screws, which is nice because it sort of holds the cardboard down. The other trick you can do to hold the cardboard is use a bottle cap and screw through that and that really grabs the cardboard. And I think that's good. Any questions, Amy? Yeah, sorry, I was having issues with my mute button. Um, yes, I've been answering lots of questions <laughs> in there um, as you've been talking, but there are a few that I thought I would, you know, verbalize because it's something that we get asked every time we do one of these trainings. Um, so folks are asking, please discuss legality. <laughs> um, you know, so has anyone gotten arrested while doing this? Um, you know, defacing public property, best time to do it, that sort of thing. And David always gives the best spiel on how to navigate this. Um, and then the second question was, how do you find the best sites for this? So uh, on legality, uh, different cities have different rules and laws about it. Uh, I was once stopped in Berkeley and uh, the cop, didn't like that I was pasting, but apparently it was legal to po wheat paste on public property. You know, since the circuses of the 19th century, they used to wheat paste up circus posters, movements all over the world, uh, poster using wheat paste. When I came up in the movements of the 80s, uh, part of you're organizing a big action, that was how you would get the word out is you'd go out through your city and your region and you'd paste up posters. Um, so long tradition, different cities have different laws. And then even within the laws, there's different practices of enforcement. And that can be impacted by where you are, who you are, what you're, how the police might treat you uh, and their relationship to the movement. Um, so yeah, I think it's something for each group to discuss. That's why I tried to give sort of a variety of everything from stapling it on your own fence taking it on walls, taking it on public places to uh, pasting. And we actually, we've, we've been doing this for about two years, haven't had reports of people being arrested yet, you know, which is, uh, you know, probably 150,000 posters out in, in lots of different ways. But, uh, you know, when we go out in the Bay Area, we prepare ourselves, make sure that people know that there is some risk if they do it on the front of a bank, they do it on a vacant building that has other wheat paste or graffiti on it, a much lower risk. Um, what else? And then uh, just start to, as you drive around your town or your community, start to think about where it would look great with a poster. Uh, is there a construction wall, you know, or if you want to do a higher risk, you know, where would it look good on the bank? And uh, we often go out in the evening. Um, I sometimes wear a, a, a work vest, a day glow traffic vest, and sort of just look like maybe, you know, when I wear a traffic vest and work clothes, people just assume it's like, okay, somebody's doing something, and sometimes you're less visible that way. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, so there was a question about, are there any chain businesses that might allow the art show concept? And I know, David, you have lots of great ideas on where it's fun to do the art shows. Uh, we just, someone just posted on Twitter and 
an art display in a retail store window that sort of a, you know has movement connected products. So yeah, think about uh, if there's stores, businesses, community centers that have either windows or walls that would let you do it legally uh, or friends who are in visible places that people might walk by. Uh, also, it's, a, it's, just a, it's such a nice way for people to engage with the issues to see some art rather than to hear a speech or get a political flyer or just a, a different gateway. So we've had uh, people do them in farmer's markets. Uh, people have actually done art shows in front of banks and set up at times like chairs, sort of like it, it was like a, a, a flea market art show or a, a craft event art show. So that's a cool place to show it is right in front of the bank just to engage the customers and get more information or in front of a, a government office. Anything else, Amy? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, there's, let's see. There's a question about way to connect with other folks in our cities. So we can put up the posters in groups for those of us who don't know others in our area doing this. Social media is your best bet. <laughs> I like to go into our local, we have like local activist groups or local climate groups and, you know, things that I belong to on Facebook and other places. And I will sometimes post who, you know, like, who wants to go postering with me or who wants to do this? And guaranteed you'll get a bunch of uh, volunteers um, that way. But I don't know, David, if you have any other ideas on connections. Well, I mean, I, I'm going to ask maybe Alec to jump in, but we've asking, been asking people if they could be a hub for their area and take, uh, you know, many more posters, like 40 or 50, and then distribute them out to other folks who might put them up in different ways. Uh, and you can order more. Um, and we've been organizing large scale, like we're going to go out twice in the East Bay and San Francisco and see if we can get together 45 people and break into 15 teams and cover a lot of area. And, you know, it will mean getting, making a lot of paste and getting the brushes and all the stuff together. Um, Alec, any comments, uh, more comments on uh, hub groups? Um, and also <clears throat> our hashtags. We're asking folks when they post to social media so we can see each other's uh, work to put up, uh, I believe it's uh, Earth Week. Hashtag Earth Week. Yeah, I don't, and um, I don't have any um, big updates on the the hub groups, other than there are in some cities there are people who have signed up to organize teams of people. I I don't have off the top of my head where where there those are, and the only. Uh, words I I would share about that is that you know I think this is a. I mean, everything we're doing is about building community power, and it's building community power in order to to challenge corporate power. And and so, if you're not uh, whoever asked that question already connected with any climate groups in your community or any local activist groups, as Amy says, I think this is a great opportunity to try and get get connected with with like minded folks and 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 um, get out there and do things like this. Um, yeah, I think I think that's the main thing is just try and try and find a group of of like minded folks who who would be willing to 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 do something like this or any other kind of climate activism and advocacy. And just to piggyback on Alec, uh, Earth Day is a great opening in that when we've when I've told people it's for Earth Week or Earth Day, people get that that's a thing, and a lot of folks who are may may not be engaged in uh, justice or environmental or climate groups. Uh, often step up that one time a year. So like in New York City, the Earth Day Initiative is taking uh, nearly a thousand copies and they're gonna mass distribute them in Manhattan. So also it's a great great tool to connect with people uh, asking them if they would like to host an art show, put up poster together, if they have a place to display them, that kind of thing. And I'll, I should also mention, which I didn't, that uh, there's another option that people can download the art Print it out themselves if you have friends with color printers or access to color printing, uh, but that's another way to uh, to access and use the art. And all the all the art is easily downloadable, as well as some of the promotional graphics and photos of other people uh, pasting it up. 
All right. I found another good one. All right. Does wheat pasting work on brick? And what's the time limit for ordering more posters? Like when should we order more if we need them? I'll, I'll start with the brick and then turn to Gemma for the other question. Uh, it depends on how rough it is, but, but yes, uh, it can take two or three times as much wheat paste. And uh, if you can take a little more time and really smooth it in so that especially this, this very thin newsprint can really soak in. So yeah, it can, you can paste on near anything. And also uh, again, encouragement to, to do a practice, just get a piece of newsprint, newspaper from something else and practice on different surfaces. And before you go out with a team, I just bring a sheet, a little piece of plywood and have everyone put, paste one up and just get a feel for it. And can I just answer from yeah. the, the voice behind the camera? So we are uh, available, sign up by 11th. April 11th, and we will be shipping um, throughout next week. If you sign up kind of at the last minute, no guarantee that it will get there um, by April 15th, so that first day of Earth Week. Uh, so the sooner you sign up, the sooner you will get your art, but um, yeah, you have until April 11th. And just a, a huge thank you to everyone who's putting this art up. I, as an organizer, I, uh, I believe that as uh, Ricardo and Amy quoted that uh, people understand uh, narratives and stories through the arts. And so as a movement, if we want to win, we need to lift up the art and we also need to look to uh, folks who have those skills of storytelling through visual art, through music, through dance, through theater, to, uh, to help lead us as movements in powerfully telling those stories and winning. So much appreciation to the organizations, the artists, and to the, hopefully, uh, I think we have, I think by the end of it, we'll have well over a thousand people around all across North America putting these up. Yes. Oh, thank, that's so beautiful. We love the art. So now I have to go, have to go back through the slides because David's showing you the art in person. Oh, it's so good. So beautiful. All right. Um, well, I mean, oh. yeah, what, David, what'd you say? I said, thank you. Yes. No, thank you. This is the, these trainings are the best. Um, so we have one more question. And I might pop this one over to Alec um, and I can answer it a little bit, but what actions are coming after Earth Week events um, to continue escalating pressure on the banks and Biden? That is a great question. If, if Molly's still here, hopefully she can jump in on, um, on Biden. But um yeah, after Earth Week, as I mentioned, three of the big four Wall Street banks have their annual shareholder meeting on April 25th. But then the world's largest funder of fossil fuels, JP Morgan Chase, has their um, annual shareholder meeting on May 16th. So there's going to be a, a continuing big push in the, the lead up to the um, Chase AGM. And then... Um, and then we're going to be doing a little bit more planning to kind of see what's next after that. We're going to be um, looking to continue to build pressure on the major investors of the banks, which includes a lot of public pensions. And we're paying more and more attention, as, as Amy knows, um, to, to public pensions, uh, city pensions and state pensions. And, and they've really been voting against a lot of um, climate resolutions. And so we're going to be continuing to, to campaign and pressure on them throughout the year. And we're also starting to think about um, who are the large clients that are the customers of these banks, you know, the the, the, corporation, the corporations or the cities or the, the states or the religious institutions or the foundations or the nonprofits. These are all customers of the banks. And we want to start perhaps running some secondary campaigns to agitate some of them being being to be allies 
um, in the fight to, to get them to end their fossil fuel financing. Um, so that's a, a little teaser of, of what's coming next, but we'll definitely be keeping the keeping the pressure on and uh, keeping the keeping the focus on um, the the banks that are that are financing climate chaos and environmental racism, and um, particularly continuing to um, to shine a light on the environmental racism happening in the Gulf South right now. I think Josie spoke to the the build out of thirty four. Um, fossil, new fossil fuel projects, and it's very much the, the 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 Gulf South is in the crosshairs of the fossil fuel industry. So, doing as much as we can to stand in solidarity with the folks in the frontline communities, um, trying to stop those projects, both through pressuring um, the White House and through pressuring Wall Street, and and that's only going to ramp up and become a bigger and bigger focus for. Um, the movement, not just in the Gulf South, but the movement nationally, because it's the the it's the, the largest build out of fossil fuels happening in the world right now is happening in the US and the Gulf South. And, and we need to be showing up all across the country for that fight and supporting the work that's happening there, there in the Gulf. Excellent. Yes, and you can always um, find actions as well by following um, all of our respective organizations on uh, Twitter or Facebook. Um, you can follow Stop the Money Pipeline on all of the socials. You can follow Stand.Earth. You can follow um, David, definitely on Slack. Our artists, too, I would love it if y'all would jump in and follow their Instagrams and um, get on their websites and show them some love. Um, if our artists want to, if you're up to it, um, you can either post them in the chat or send them to me afterwards and I can put them in our follow-up um, email and make sure everybody has all of those. Um, I'm also sharing a few links in the chat. Um, just one more time for the toolkit, the link to receive art, the wheat paste recipe, um, and the fundraiser. Um, if you're getting art and you are able, please donate to the fundraiser. This is how we cover shipping, um, especially to folks um, outside the U.S. and to our bigger groups who, you know, need hundreds and hundreds of posters. Shipping isn't cheap, friends. Um, so if you are able, please donate to that. Um, and then once again, a reminder, all of these resources will be shared um, tomorrow. We download all the RSVPs, everybody who came tonight, and I email all of you and I say, hey, friends, here's the slide deck, here's the recording, here's the kit, here's how to sign up, here's how to follow the artists. All of the things will be included in our wrap-up email tomorrow. So um, for all those questions um, in the Q&A on resources and when they'll be available, um, you know, Zoom has to download this and then we have to upload it to the Stop the Money Pipeline YouTube. And um, that does take a little bit of work, but we do um, get it out pretty quickly the next day. Um, anything else from any, any of our artists or David, Alec, anyone else, anything before we have to wrap up here for the evening? See everybody in the streets and on the walls. Yes. All right. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up um, our art training for this evening. Thank you so much um, to all of our artists. We are so incredibly grateful for your creativity and the beauty and the happiness that you bring to our movement. Um, it is everything. Thank you to David for doing these art trainings and teaching us how to wheat paste and how to use these and how we make this happen in our communities and for our local groups. Thank you to Stop the Money Pipeline. Thank you to People versus Fossil Fuels and everyone who helped make this um, Art Week of Action possible. And don't forget to send us your photos and videos or tag us on socials. Um, thank you everyone very much. Have a wonderful rest of your night. And we will, as David said, see you in the streets. Good night.